<laughs> well, that was a fun experiment. Again, thank you all for being with us. We're so thrilled to have uh, Len Burke and Melissa Clark here as our guests on this pre-Yom Kippur uh, discussion about locks and life and all things appetizing. Len Burke is our 90-year-old locks columnist. As I said, he was the last Jewish lock slicer at Zabar's. And when the pandemic hit, uh, suddenly he wrote to us and said that he had been let go and we asked him to write about it. Len, you want to pick up the story from there? How did you become our locks columnist? Well, when Zebars let me go, they, they did it with their best intentions. They were concerned that my age would, would make me more vulnerable to the COVID. And the manager said, Len, I don't want you here next Thursday and Friday. And I didn't go back. They were very concerned about it. However, I didn't like the idea that they were the ones that were deciding what I should and should not do. So that was when I wrote the first piece that I sent to the forward and stated my position about what I thought was proper. One of the key things was What's more important to put yourself in a situation where you might contract the virus or give up a workplace that you've been at for the last 24, 25 years that was actually so much part of my life that I couldn't imagine not going there Thursdays and Fridays. So I put that in my piece and I sent it to the forward and they apparently liked it because that was the beginning of something wonderful. Right, so I mean there was this, you started out the pandemic with this kind of gap in your life and in your schedule that you were no longer going to be working at Zabar's as you had for so long and you were you were clearly very bereft but one of the ways you've ended up filling that gap is with all this writing. You've written now something more than a dozen pieces for us which our readers love. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. You've suddenly become a columnist. Yes, it was, a, it was a shock to me, but when I look back over some of the parts of my past life, for example, when I was uh, a judge at the cooking competition of the Taipei Food Festival back in uh, 1993, I think, I took copious notes and I saved all those notes. When I was doing my gourmet dining tours to Hong Kong, every place I went, I took notes. I wrote to my wife who was at home every day and I kept all those notes. And those notes has, have been part of what you consider my great memory. Yeah, so because of our little technical glitch before, I, I'm sort of remiss in not actually introducing our, our panel and our panelists and our, and our conversation. So I'm gonna back out for a sec to again, welcome everybody. We have a great audience here. And I believe we are also broadcasting this live on Facebook at the same time. I wanna let everyone know that everyone who's here and everyone who registered will get a video of the conversation in their email uh, tomorrow or later this week, along with any links that we put in the chat and other information we think we, you want. Um, and I wanted to just welcome not only Len, but my colleague and friend, Melissa Clark from NYT Cooking, who is an amazing uh, recipe writer, video uh, foods uh, expert. She has authored uh, 42 cookbooks, or participated in authoring 42 cookbooks, which is astounding. Um, her next one comes out in November. It's called Kid in the Kitchen, and it's about, uh, it's written by her and her husband, she and her husband, and, about, and, and with the help of their tweenage daughter, Dahlia, which I'm very much looking forward to. I was telling Melissa earlier that I cooked one of her recipes over this weekend, um, and I'm thrilled to have her join me in this conversation. Uh, just a couple of, a little tachless note, which is to say, um, on Zoom, there are a couple of ways, where, there are a couple of different technologies you can use. Some of you have already started using the chat. I encourage you to share to all panelists and attendees. Please feel free to post there any comments you have that you wanna share with everybody. You might put there right now where you're uh, dialing in from or what your favorite uh, smoked fish is that you like. What do you like to eat on Yom Kippur? 
If you have a question that you'd like me to ask Len and Melissa, you should put that in the Q&A, not in the chat. Um, the Q&A button and the chat button will be on the bottom if you're on a computer, on the side if you're on a phone or tablet. But don't put questions in the chat, put chat in the chat, put questions in the Q&A, and don't raise your hand because I don't know how to call on you. So don't do that. Um, but now I want to turn to Melissa um, and ask you a little bit about um, your sort of origin story with smoked fish. What are your kind of earliest memories um, around smoked fish and around break fast if they are? Well, you know, when I was growing up, smoked fish was a Sunday morning thing. We Every Sunday morning, my dad, it was a special thing. My dad would take my sister and me to an appetizing store in Brooklyn. There was one on Avenue C when I was growing up, right off of Ocean Parkway. Um, sometimes we'd go to the one on Avenue J. And um, and we had this every Sunday morning. Like, this was our, our thing. And we went to the appetizing store. We'd get, my dad would always say, three-eighths of a pound. Three-eighths of a pound, Len. Is that annoying? Nova, slice it in. That was his thing because you know he was he was he was, he was a little cheap. I'm just gonna say it, and um, and then I would get a pickle from the barrel. There were the pickles in the barrel. I always wanted the little crisp ones, half sours, and uh, this was a great our great family time. And then um, as I got older, I on Sunday mornings we shifted and we started. My sister and I started taking lessons at a place called the Hebrew Arts School, which was up on the Upper West Side, and that is when we would go to Zabar's. So we shifted the whole. So when I was little, it was all you know Brooklyn based, and then as I was a tween and a teenager, we started going to Zabar's. So we would drive in, um, and I would. Um, my parents would drop us off at the Hebrew art school. I'd take piano and Israeli folk dance and all these things. And my parents would go to Zabar's and they would do the shopping. And then we would come home and we kind of had this late meal, this sort of afternoon meal that wasn't brunch. Um, and when I, and then I went to Barnard and when I went to Barnard, then Zabar's again became, you know, because it was on the other side, it became the, the locus point for me, but we didn't have it for breakfast. Breakfast we had at my aunt Sandy's house and we had sweet and sour fish and that was salmon. She would make the sweet and sour salmon or sweet and sour fish. I never, ever liked it. I never knew you could have bagels and lox as a breakfast. Like I didn't find that out until I was a grown up and other people started going to other people's breakfast. I was like, wait a second, you don't have that sweet and sour fish. And then <laughs> once, I, once I figured that out, I was like, okay, I know what I'm doing from now on. Len, what about you? Did you grow up eating smoked fish on Sundays in Brooklyn or what were your earliest memories of both smoked fish and breakfast? Similar, we had lox and cream cheese on bagels almost every weekend. And do you, do you remember, and did you have it for breakfast too? Do you remember much about your early breakfasts? I don't really have a memory of that. I do so, remember just having bagels and lox on weekends and it was traditional. Melissa mentioned her dad had this very specific three-eighths of a pound, sliced thin, and you've written about how the different kinds of customers you saw at Zabar's and how many of them had such very specific requests as though perhaps they knew more than you did about how to slice the fish. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Is that a, a common thing what Melissa's dad would do with this very specific, oh, not thin enough kind of thing? Well, I wouldn't say that they felt they know more, they knew more about lox than I did, but they had very specific requirements. They, some, want, some of them wanted it from the tail end, some of them wanted it from the head end, some wanted it from the belly. They wanted two inch slices or three inch slices. People that come to Zabar's know very much what they want, but they can sometimes be very difficult to deal with. But I managed. <laughs> Managed. I love what you said in one column. You told the one guy, I'll slice it so thin it will only have one side, I, Mr. Rosenberg. That was, I think that's the 105 year old man you wrote about? Yeah. He was, he was a special guy, I guess, huh? Oh, he was a special guy. Older than me. It's amazing you how you're not believing that you're 90. Um, you waited on quite a number of famous people. Yeah. Uh, Isaac Perlman, Al Franken, Lauren Bacall, Jerry Seinfeld, Jerry Stiller. Who and were some of your favorite? And Mira. Uh, and Mira, right. I don't know, who were some of your favorite uh, customers over your many years working there? 
Well, my conversation with uh, Itzhak Perlman will stay with me forever. You know, I thought I was going to be able to trip him up, and I wasn't able to. I, I wrote that story. I don't know if you want me to tell it now, but yeah, maybe. go ahead and tell it, and I'll share it in the chat too. Well, when I when I was waiting on Itzhak Perlman, he asked me about some particular cookies, and uh, I said, "Yeah, we have them. I'll get them for you." So I went to the cookie section, saw the cookies he wanted, but the company made two varieties of those cookies. One had nuts on it and the other did not. So I took both and I went back to him and I said, Mr. Perlman, would you like to try the one with nuts? In the past, you only had the one that was plain. And he said, no, no, when you have something good, you stick with it. So I thought for a moment, and then I said, uh, let me ask you something. If, if a 14-year-old if a child came over to you and said she just composed her first violin concerto, and she asked you to play it, would you say, no, no, I only play Mendelssohn and Beethoven? And he looked at me and said, that's a totally different thing. <laughs> Melissa, I want to ask you about smoked fish, lox in particular, but smoked fish generally, and where, how you see it fitting into sort of the culinary smorgasbord, for lack of a better word, and, you know, how Jewish is it? How mainstream has it become? How are modern um, chefs and foodies kind of relating to it? And can you talk a little bit about, yeah, like, you know, the Jewish identity of this, of this genre of food and, and, and also, is it making a comeback or where, where are we in, in kind of the history of lox? Well, I mean, right now it's making a big comeback in New York, for sure. We have, um, we've been seeing a lot of appetizing stores, small appetizing stores come back by, you know, opened by young people. There's Shelsky's in Brooklyn. There's um, a couple more in Brooklyn. Um, and this is a great thing. I mean, this is just people finding their, I mean, Black Sea Bagel for another one. Um, people finding, um, going back to their roots and deciding that they want to um, kind of broaden the appeal. Uh, it, you know, in a in kind of an annoying hipster way, but I, I forgive them because any food is good food. I mean, it's just delicious and it can start with the hipsters and then it can go mainstream. That's fine with me. Um, but, it, you know, just in terms of real mainstream smoked fish, I mean, smoking something, smoking fish, that is, it's traditional across all cultures. I mean, it's not something particularly Jewish. What's Jewish is combining the smoked salmon or the smoked fish with cream cheese, like on a bagel, like that particular, like you just don't see that, you know, you might see smoked fish in, you know, oat French cuisine, but you do not see the same kind of juxtaposition. And so frankly, I don't know if we invented it, but we get the credit for this, for popularizing this particular, um, this particular uh, iteration of the way you serve smoked fish. And I do think it is superior to most other ways of serving smoked fish. But smoked fish itself is just, a, it's a way to preserve, you know, in many cultures, if you have fish, you're gonna, you're gonna salt it and you're gonna smoke it. And also, you know, I also wanna just um, mention that, you know, it's not always smoked. I mean, as lamb, you know, I'm sure, obviously you could talk about better than I can. I mean, originally lox was not smoked, but it was salted. It was the, it was the bell, it was the salmon that was put in a barrel of salt and it was salted and that was how it was preserved. So lox is, you know, much saltier than other types of appetizing and, you know, true belly lox, if it's real, then that, that's a salted thing. So you have different types of, um, of appetizing. You have smoked, you have salted, um, and it's just combining it in this particular way that makes it Jewish, I think. I'm what, do you, what, what do you think? I don't know, is my analysis, would you agree with me? <laughs> Absolutely, you picked up a lot of good stuff there. <laughs> I just put in the chat one of my favorite columns from Len, which had one of the best headlines, and I wanna stop to, make, to have a shout out to um, Adam Langer, our senior culture and features editor, who's been working with Len on all these columns and wrote the amazing headline, The Sturgeon Will See You Now, on Len's guide to smoke fish, which has all of the, a lot of the particulars that Melissa was talking about, looking at hot smoked, cold smoked, and kippered salmon, and what the difference is between baked and kippered salmon. You can learn a lot in there. But it makes me wonder about, for both of you who are, um, you know, profound home cooks, do you smoke your own uh, fish at home, either of you? And any, any or Melissa made a face. No, this is something you buy in the store. There's talk, so this is not something you want to make yourself. 
I grab locks, none of it. You're not doing it yourself. Not I'll grab locks yet. Gra I'll give you grab locks. <laughs> yeah. Why not? I make grab make locks. It as good as the... Say it again, Len. Sorry. I have made grab locks, but not smoked salmon. I'm not equipped to really smoke salmon properly. But and you told. You, I asked you, um, Ed Silverstein just asked, who else is hungry listening to this? When we were talking about when to have it, we did plan on ha having it, you know, in the cocktail hour, at least on the East Coast. So please feel free to have a little uh, nosh while we're talking. Um, grab, a, grab a glass of wine and a nosh. That would be fine with us. Um, Len, you told, I asked you how you learned how to slice smoked salmon. And... Um, or other smoked fish. And uh, you said, first of all, that you started slicing your own before you started working at Zabar's. So tell us about that. Well, I was probably one of Zabar's best customers for many years before I started to work there. And when I went there, I would find, I would walk up and down the aisle. I was probably more particular customer than all of the people that I've been complaining about over the years. I find a piece of salmon that I thought I liked and I would get a chunk of it, you know, something maybe a foot square or with a tapered edge. And I'd buy it and I'd go home and slice it. And I, I so enjoyed slicing it. It's a special thing to slice salmon. You have to have the knack for it. You have the knack for it. You do it well. You like to do it. So I have to pause there to have a shout out to my dad, who I believe is here, Richie Wilgoran. He is one of those people. He, when I moved to New York many years ago, I think his favorite thing about me living in New York was, it was an excuse for him to come visit from Boston. And he would always come on a Friday when he could go to the Acme store in Williamsburg. They would do uh, sales to, there's a whole, it's a wholesale operation, but on Friday mornings they would sell direct to the consumer and he would buy a side of salmon and um, put it in the freezer in chunks and he takes it out and hand slices it. Uh, so he and you, I think, are very simpatico, Len. Do you do the same thing, Melissa? Do you hand slice or you buy it? No, I always buy, when I buy my, um, when I buy my, my Lux, my Nova, just to be, you know, technical, when I buy that, I, um, I always have it sliced. I don't ask for it sliced thin anymore. That was it. I actually kind of like the thicker slices, you get more. So <laughs> that was it. Yeah, I used to do that, but, you know, I've, I, now that I've, I'm, I'm an adult and I don't have to do what my dad did. I, I just get it sliced regularly. Um, but you know, the slicing does come into play when I make Gravlox because I do make Gravlox probably about once a year. And then I really do wish, Len, that I had your knack. I mean, I, I, this is how I do it. I, I do the best I can. I have the good fish knife. I try really hard to, you know, to get nice even slices. I'd say about a quarter of it is just Whoosh. It just, I cannot get, like, I can't do it for the whole thing. So any, any um, tips you have, I would love to hear. And then what I do, so then to compensate, I take all those little bitsy bits and I chop them up and I make Gravlox tartare and I serve it on like, you know, mix it with onions, you serve it on a cracker, it's delicious, but it's not, you know, the nice slices, which is what you really, really want. Len, can you give us any quick tips without being in the kitchen with the knife to show us? A quick tips about what? about how to slice perfectly. Oh. <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's a tough one to, to explain how to slice it. There are different slicing methods. You can slice straight across the top of the salmon. You can slice on a bias on both sides. The thinness really has to do with your uh, ability has to do with a steady hand. If you have a steady hand, you can make thin slices. If your hand is not steady, you have to feel at home with the fish. And I've I seen great stuff in the chat. I want to remind people to direct your chats to all panelists and attendees so everybody can see your comments because they're great. People are recommending ways to use your extra bits, Melissa, um, with scrambled eggs or matzo rye, which I certainly do oh, both of those things. There was a question that I saw, is a fish knife serrated or not? Not, what? right? You don't want to use a serrated knife on the fish, do you? No. No, a straight knife? Great. And I wanted to say that Len, um, when I asked him earlier how he learned how to slice fish, he said, you learn how to slice, you learn by doing. 
And I see other people in the chat saying practice, and I certainly appreciate that. Melissa, I want to turn back to you about uh, thinking about break fast. I mean, you're a, a cook. You're a cook, you're a recipe writer, you're someone who encourages all of us to cook at home and makes it accessible to us and you're a, a great cook. And I, it always feels a little bit like a cop out to me to serve bagels and lox, right? Because you're not cooking, you're just buying well, right? Um, I wanna know what you make for break fast and whether you cook or put out bagels and lox and how you think about that dilemma. Am I right that it's like, is it, is it okay to serve bagels and lox and not cook? I think, I mean, if any time, if there's any time that you're going to do it, it's going to be for breakfast because first of all, especially you don't want to be in the kitchen. Like the last thing you want to do on Yom Kippur is go into the kitchen because there's food there. And if you're fasting, you just don't want to be tempted. So generally, I think for a lot of people, just buy it, put it in your fridge and then put it out and do as little as possible until you're ready to actually break the fast. I don't fast every year. In fact, I haven't fasted in several years. Um, so I could cook, but the tradition for me is also like, I still don't go in the kitchen. And if I don't fast, I feel really guilty. And then I don't want to, you know, so I have a very complicated relationship with cooking on Yom Kippur. I just feel like it's better. Even if I'm not fasting, I'm not going to cook. I'm going to, you know, just be kind of quiet about everything. Um, so I do think that um, I think any way that you want to get through it is fine. The important thing, and this is really important, is you got to shop. The, you have to shop, and you have to have everything ready, and you do have to be very generous. Like Yom Kippur is the breakfast is when you you don't want three eighths of a pound. You know, like you want to feed everybody. You want to have enough for everybody. You're not stinting. You want to have. Um, you just want to have a beautiful. I think very, I think it's important for it to be beautiful and lush and have a lot of things. Um, you, I sometimes I'll make salads ahead of time, you know, like I'll make, um, like I love to make things like, you know, um, baba ganoush ahead of time or roasted carrot salad ahead of time. Uh, things that I can do the day before and they sit in the fridge and then I'll bring them out. And I always do have a fruit salad. That's something I like. I don't know why. I don't, I don't know where I got that, but I like to have a fruit salad. I mean, maybe because it's breakfast and it's breakfast and I like fruit in the morning, but so that I'll do right beforehand. That's the one thing I sort of cook, but it's really just a sound, it's cutting up the fruit. Um, or often I'll ask somebody, I will task someone when they say, what can I bring? I'll say, okay, will you bring the fruit salad? They say, fruit salad, really? I'm like, yes, it's just, it's part of my thing. Um, and then uh, the other thing is, um, if I want to do, sometimes I'll pickle a lot of vegetables. Like I love to do that the day before, you know, like quick pickles, just because you want something sort of salty and appetite. I mean, you're hungry enough, but I, I do think that they're the pick. I, I do think there's something nice about homemade pickles, like pickled carrots, pickled radishes, um, pickled onions, and have like a nice bowl of that. So, but aside from that, it's, it's bagels, cream cheese, lox, white fish salad, um, seven layer halva for dessert, cut up in little bits which is a chocolate covered right. halva. If you don't know what seven layer halva is, it's chocolate covered deliciousness. I'm looking in our, our Q&A, which is where you should put your questions if you have them. We have tons of great questions. So I want to turn to that sooner rather than later. But first I have one for Len based on what Melissa just said, which is whitefish, whitefish salad. Talk to us about those two options. Which do you like better? What's the, what's the best way I'm, to eat your whitefish? I'm, pure. I'm a purist. When I want whitefish. I want whitefish. I don't want celery and mayonnaise. So I prefer a chunk of whitefish. Melissa, so rebut? You know, okay, I have to say, Len, with all respect to Zabar's, um, the Russ and Daughters baked white whitefish salad with the baked salmon in it. Like that is, I love that so much. It doesn't have celery. It just doesn't have, to, and I, I, I don't like the celery either. I don't want celery in my whitefish salad. I agree with you 100%. But this is baked salmon and white fish and I think mayo and maybe there's some onion in there. There's not much, but it's just, um, I think it's delicious. perfect. However, I do love white fish by itself. You know what's really good, and Len, I'm sure you know this is really good. When you take a bagel and you toast it and you put tons of butter on it and then you put the white fish and onions, that's delicious. I, per I personally like white fish salad on the bagel with lox on top instead of no cream cheese, just white fish salad and, and yeah. Oh, or just a piece of lox wrapped with the white fish salad in it when you're when you're low carbing it. We talked about that on our pre-call about how you take the lox and you roll stuff up in it and you don't have the bagel sometimes. Yeah. Lynn, I want to know how you do your bagel. How do you dress your bagel? Like how is your what's your perfect bagel combination? And what's your favorite bagel flavor? My favorite bagel flavor is quite simple. 
It's cream cheese with chive on a poppy seed bagel with probably uh, a Scottish salmon on top. Mm. Mm. Scottish. How about you, Melissa? What's your favorite bagel? It's so complicated um, (laughs) because I love it so many different ways. So I'm like, but I like it with, I mean, butter and whitefish or butter and sable with onions. That's, that is delicious. So generally what I do, and I'm embarrassed to admit this, but I'm just going to tell you honestly what I do. I take a bagel and I cut it into quarters and each quarter gets this different treatment so I can enjoy it all kinds (laughs) of ways. I know it's crazy, right? So one of them has butter and either sable and or whitefish on top and onions. Another one has classic Len, like you just said, although I don't do the chives, I just do plain cream cheese, plain, uh, usually Nova. Um, I like the Gaspé um, and some sliced onions, capers and tomato. So that's that one. Then I do, Jody white fish salad and no cream cheese, white fish salad and um, lox on top, you know, or uh, smoked salmon on top. And then the last one is kind of the wild card. It's whatever I haven't, whichever one spoke to me the most and I'll do it again. Nice, I love that. So I want to take a moment, um, Len, you said poppy seed is your favorite bagel. And I, um, wanted, I, I, was, I wanted to take a, it's interesting to be having a light conversation and a heavy, heavy news week after the death of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And I discovered this weekend as we were covering uh, the aftermath of Justice Ginsburg's death, we went, I went back to the 2018 interview that my predecessor did with Ginsburg live at a Washington DC synagogue. And one of the things Jane Eisner, my predecessor, did in all of her interviews with big famous people was ask them their favorite bagel flavor. Ruth Bader Ginsburg's favorite flavor, according to this 2018 interview, was also poppy, as was President Obama's and Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's. So Jane asked all of them their favorite bagel flavor, and they and Len all had the same pick, poppy seed. Wow. It's a thing. Wow. I am going to turn to these wonderful questions from the audience now. I want to start. Richard Ticknor was the first person to put questions in, and he has seven questions, and they are specific, and I'm going to try to do them in a rapid fire. So the first question is, is Acme the lock supplier to Zabar's? Yes. One of them. The second question is, how is salmon processed to become locks? We're going to set that aside. It's too complicated. Belly locks versus Nova. I'm going to refer you, Richard, to what I put in the chat. The, the surgeon, surgeon will see you now for the how-tos. Is there a shelf life once this locks get sliced from the counter? Repeat that, please. Like, how long would you say is the shelf life once the locks get sliced from the counter? How long would you mean? How long can you order it, Zabar's? How long can you keep it in the refrigerator? Yeah, how long can you keep it? Well, it depends how well the lox was taken care of before it sliced. That's very important that the flocks, that the salmon be properly refrigerated at a certain degree. You can keep it in your refrigerator if it, if it was properly smoked and properly refrigerated. I've kept it for up to two weeks. And I find that lox freezes beautifully too, right? Pardon? I've had a lot of luck freezing uh, vacuum-packed locks from Acme or other places and then pulling it out. Vacuum-packed smoked salmon doesn't hold a, a candle to freshly sliced. It's you like, sound just like my dad. That's just what my dad would have said if I said that. And he's probably embarrassed that I said it publicly. So, sorry, Dad. How many pounds of locks, Richard Tickner wants to know, get sliced at Zabar's during an average week? A ton. A ton. <laughs> 2,000 pounds. I think 2,000 pounds is a ton, if I remember correctly. I would say at least a ton. Um, excellent. And a, a more complicated question from Richard is, he said that he noticed that all the lock slicers at Zabar's um, have a different technique, a slightly different technique. So he wants to know who teaches them, who trains them. It depends. If you come with some experience, then you have a certain style. If, if not, you just watch. I remember when I started the first day, uh, I was interviewed by Saul Zabar for the job, and I went down, and he said, I got to see what you can do. 
So go behind the counter and let's see what you can do. So I went behind the counter and uh, I just watched. I got familiar with the scales. And after a while, someone said to me, do you have a customer? They didn't realize that I was just there being examined by the owner. And I said, yes. And that was how I started my career. I don't know if I answered your question. What was your question? Oh, that was a good answer. And I guess um, the, it leads me to the other question, another question I wanted to ask, which is, so Len, you spent your working life, your main working life, your first working life as an accountant. You um, ran a firm with a partner. And then at a relatively early age, I think at age 60, right? You decided to right. retire and sell your part in the business. You then yeah. got into a, a gig that you mentioned earlier doing Epicurean tours of Asia. And then at some point later, you went to work at Zabar's. And then now you have a, a new flourishing career as a writer. And I guess I'm interested in your reflections on a life lived in chapters like that. It's an inspiration really to us about the idea that one can keep reinventing oneself. And I wonder how you reflect on that as from your 90 years young perch. Well, when I wrote my first piece that I sent to the forward uh, and they printed it, it encouraged me to uh, write more. And I suddenly realized that I was able to write and I don't know where I, where I learned that, or is it an innate talent? I don't know. But I feel I can just sit down now and write stuff. Um, I'm asking, Maria Waltemeyer is asking, uh, is there a smoked fish equivalent in Sephardic cuisine? I wonder, Melissa, if you have an answer to that, or if you would even, do you consider it an Ashkenazi thing, smoked fish? An interesting question. Um, I think, you know, I was, I've been thinking about this, um, the, um, the history or just the provenance of this, uh, this sweet and sour fish that my aunt Sandy always made. And I, I, I was wondering if it was related to an Eskabesh. So I was wondering if it was Sephardic in origin. So, but it, you know, but that's, a, that's a, obviously not the question you're asking me. So I don't know. Um, I don't, I'm sure there is a smoked fish type, but I don't know if it's the same. I just don't know. You know, Len? You know, I don't know the answer to that, actually. I wish I, I, I have got Claudia Rudin right here. I wonder if I could look it up real quick for you. But Len, what do you? I don't know the answer to that question. Okay, so well, if any of our attendees are Sephardic or no Sephardic cuisine, please share uh, thoughts in the chat about smoked fish alternatives. We're also getting a lot of questions. People are asking, um, questions about where to get the best locks in this place or that place. But Donald Collish asks a slightly more general question. He says, what do you advise for appetizing if we don't live in New York City? Some of us don't even live in the city, calling for help from rural New Hampshire. Um, so maybe this is where you bring out your homemade grab locks? I'm not sure, what do you guys think? What should, what should Donald Collish and his others who are far from a good appetizing store do uh, to get their fix? Well, not, not everybody can make Roblox. So if you live outside New York in any of the places where there are no appetizing stores, enter Acme. You have to use Acme or Banner. You can only, that, that's the best that's available. So it's better than nothing. Oh, I mean, I, mo I think most of the appetizing stores will ship. I mean, I know, I'm pretty sure yeah. Zabar ships. I know Russ and Daughter ships. Um, so you can't, it's expensive though, you know, to have it shipped because you have to have it FedExed overnight. So it really is expensive. Um, so I would say, you know, once a year for Yom Kippur or for a special occasion, it's something to do. Um, you know, Gravelux is great, but it's not the same. And it's not, I don't, I love it, but I don't really want it on a bagel with cream cheese. I don't know. I mean, is that just, right. you guys feel the same way? Am I just not being fair to Gravelox? No, Gravlox is a... <laughs> the Gravlox lobby own, is going to come out own, to you, Melissa. It's I know, own right? item. You don't put that on a bagel. Okay, what about... Wait, I just had an idea. I just want to say it out loud. What if you made Gravlox with smoked salt? Just, just putting it out there. Th think about it. 
Okay, I'm done. I'm going to think. <laughs> get back to you next year with okay. a call. <laughs> Len, Victor Schwartz wants to know, why is the hand slice lox so much better than the package? He asks, is it the same fish? But this feels like an existential question also. Why is the hand slice lox so much better than the package? I, uh, I used to get asked that question all the time. People would come up and say, it's the same, right? One cost $20 a pound, the other cost $40 a pound. And they want me to tell them it's the same. So I, I deal with that in many different ways. If I feel that the person doesn't have enough money to, to, to spend on hand slice locks, I tell them it's the same. In a certain sense, it is the same. It is the same fish, but it's sliced by machine. The machine slices are totally different than hand sliced. And then it's packaged, and you don't know how long it's sitting on this shelf. So it is the same fish, but it's not really the same fish. Because how you take care of your fish is very important. Packaged fish could be there for two weeks. I mean, I suppose, Melissa, this applies to many foods, right? Making yeah. it by hand, doing it something by hand is in general fresher, more careful if you do it right than what comes in a package. Well, I was just thinking that, you know, when Len was speaking, I was just thinking the truth to what you're saying, it really does cut across so many different things. I mean, because it's not just the ingredient, you can get the same ingredient, but processing and handling that ingredient is absolutely as important as getting the freshest ingredient. Right. Whether you are cooking it yourself or whether it's someone else is handling it for you. The way you cut, I mean, this is like, just think about it this way. The way you cut an onion determines how it tastes, right? Like if you cut it, if you mince it, or, or think about garlic maybe is more accessible if you think about it, right? You mince or grate garlic, you're gonna get a one kind of flavor. You thinly slice it, you get a whole other flavor. And then when you smash it and you leave it in the peel or you take it out of the peel, it's also different flavors, same garlic, totally process is different. So I, I mean, what you just said about lox, of course it makes perfect sense, but people don't necessarily assume that it's gonna be as important as it is. But when you think, when you apply this, that analogy to other foodstuffs, you can see, well, of course. Um, so I'm getting uh, lots of, some technical questions. Some people wanna know how to close the chat. If you have the chat box open, you should be able to close it by just clicking on the upper left corner the red button. Um, I know there's a lot of activity in the chat, which is great. If you want to communicate privately with one of the attendees, I think you can go to participants, but we do have more than a thousand participants on this call. So you could try to search their name. Um, again, if you have questions, we're trying to get through quite a few of them, but please put them in the Q&A. And just a reminder, just again, a little more tachlis, we're gonna talk for another 15 or 20 minutes. You will all get in your email uh, a video of this presentation, which we hope you will share with your friends and followers, as well as the links we've put in here and some of the other links. I also wanted to just let, I want to I want to do a couple quick thank yous, especially to Lisa Lepson, who has helped managing this event and who helped us plan this event. Also, Dina Cooperman of the Forward staff and um, the, the rest of our team at the Forward and of course, Adam Langer, um, Lens editor. Thrilled to have Melissa from NYT Cooking, my old um, New York Times stomping ground. And I also just want to make sure everybody here, we're going to put a link in the chat, which will probably get lost, but we'll send it to you again in the email, knows that we have um, a special virtual gala coming up next month on October 19th. Um, it is comedy and cocktails. Come as you are, give what you want. Uh, attendance is free and uh, we are reader supported nonprofit, so we hope you will participate in our auction or make a donation, but really we just want to be together in community at this time. We have a great lineup of comedians. Our MC is Jessica Kirsten. Um, we have various other celebrities. Um, you'll get more of me and other things. So you can, we're going to put that, that the, the link is in the chat now. Please come, please bring your friends. And you will also get in your email, everybody who is attending tonight will get a discounted subscription to The Forward. So watch your email for all that great stuff. And I wanna go back now to some of our questions. People have a lot of questions about different fishes and how they relate. I, I refer you to the, sturgeon general, the Sturgeon's Guide, but 
Karen Fleischman asks, given all of your knowledge, he wants to know, she wants to know what should we be ordering? And I'm interested in both of your takes on this from the head, from the belly, slice thin, slice not thin, which fish, I mean, I guess some of this, one answer is gonna be whatever you like, you should order, but can you give us a little bit more advice about how to, how to at least sound like we know what we're doing? Well, in general, if you like it lean, then you ask for the tail of the fish. If you like it fatty, you ask for the head or the belly part. That's basically it. You agree, Melissa? Yeah, I mean, I, I know I'm not that presumptive. I don't ask. I just because I like it both ways. Like I don't. I'm not one of those people who asks. You know, can I have it from there? You know, maybe I'm a little bit scarred from my dad and his three eighths of a pound. You know, so I just get the. I just can I have. And these days I'm like, can I have a pound? I want a whole pound. <laughs> <laughs> can you? And let's let's do a quick tutorial on Nova versus Belly Locks versus Smoked Salmon, and then people are also asking for the quickest version of how do I make Gravlax or what is Gravlax. So can we, can you guys walk us through those I'll things? I'll do Gravelox, Len, you do the other ones. <laughs> Belly, Nova, Smoked. You want to do Gravelox? Go. Oh, or I should do that first? Okay. Yeah. Um, so Gravelox is, um, it's cured raw salmon. Um, and so what you do is I always get, I get a side of salmon or you just get a piece of, however big, it doesn't matter how big it is. You cut it in half. Um, and then it's so easy. You, you basically, the point, all you have to do is season it with um, a thick layer of salt and sugar mixed together. I don't have the exact proportions, but there's a million recipes online, but it, you don't, it doesn't even matter. It's sugar and salt, more, sh more salt than sugar, just a little sugar. You don't want it too sweet, at least for me, I don't like it too sweet. And then you want to put in seeds and herbs. So what I like to do is I love to add, um, fennel seed, you don't have to. You could just put dill, just put like a ton of dill and sit, smash it together. But I really like to add some either fennel or coriander, um, crushed up seeds. You rub that on at, with your sugar and your salt and um, some black pepper or some white pepper. If you can get good white pepper, it's fabulous. Um, and then your herbs. So traditionally it would just be dill. Sometimes if I'm using a little fennel seed, I will add fennel fronds to the dill to give it a fennel taste. Sometimes I'll add some tarragon, but traditionally it would just be your dill. Take it and so you do this on both sides of your salmon. You know, you've got, you've got both sides coated with the salt and the sugar. You've got your herbs, smush them together. Then you put them in a Ziploc bag or you wrap them, you know, tightly in, um, plastic wrap, put them on, I like to use a sheet tray because that way, because it will drip and you don't want it to get all over your fridge. So put it in a rim sheet tray, put another rim sheet tray on top, and then you weight it down with like a can of, you know, big can of tomatoes or something like that, or whatever you have. Put it in the fridge. And then this is the important thing. Every single day for three days, you turn it. You turn it once a day, just open it up. You know, you don't have to take it out of its package. It's sealed up in your, it's sealed up in its nice little plastic, turn it over the thing back down, the weight back on, do that for three days, and then that's it. That's it. And then you take it off, you brush it off, you, you know, you give it a rinse, actually, is what I usually do. Give it a rinse, pat it dry, and then you use Len's fabulous technique of cutting perfect slices. Len, talk to us about belly locks, Nova, regular old smoked salmon. Well, belly locks originally comes from the old country before they had uh, the ability to uh, to uh, cure the salmon, they cured it in salt. And that, that provided lox. Lox is nothing more than salmon encased in salt, could be for more than a month in the refrigerator. And that would be lox. Lox, they talk about belly lox. Belly lox just means that the lox is from the belly part of the salmon. But you can have a, an entire side of salmon called salty lox. It doesn't have to be from the belly. But belly lox is something that everybody talks about. Uh, so then what's Nova? Nova, is, Nova and smoked salmon are synonymous. There are many different kinds of smoked salmon, but Nova is smoked salmon. You have there are different cures involved. The Scottish cure their way, the Irish cure their way. And you just have to find the one that you like. And you can like them all and you get a little bit of each. 
And Bill Ryer is noting that lox, he says, is the German word for salmon. So that's where that comes from, apparently. Yeah, right. Um, L-A-C-K-S is how he would render that in English. Um, right. Louise Weissman says she, I think this one's going to be controversial, so hold on to your seats there, but Louise Weissman belongs to a group of people born in three neighborhoods in Boston that all had large Jewish immigrant populations. She said they had a discussion today about lox, onions, and eggs. Lox, onion, and eggs, a scramble or an omelet. Some folks don't like it. Some think the lox loses the flavor when it's in the skillet. She says, any comments? So this is back to this question of, should you mess with the lox? Like, right, can you cook with it? Should you cook with it? What, what do you guys say? Lox, onion, and eggs, discuss. To each his own. Melissa, whatever you do with it. If, whatever you like to do with it, you do. Len, yeah. what do you do? What do you do? I'll tell you what I do after. I want to know what you do. Do you eat lox, eggs, and onions? That's not one of my favorite things. You know, I'm, as I said earlier, I'm a purist. Sometimes I'll just eat the lox. You know, you know, we had a, a word that hasn't come up in this conversation is sablefish. Which oh, is I meant I. I think I mentioned it, but because I love it on, yeah. I love it with butter on a bagel. Sa oh, I, what I, is sablefish? Sablefish is uh, actually sable is the family of fish, and the actual fish is uh, black cod. But it's a favorite. It's a favorite, and it's delicious if it's not too salty. Agreed. I would say that's the second favorite at Zabar's. Is sable is the second favorite? Yeah. Now somebody asked, what whatever happened to barbecued cod? Is that related to sable? Maybe they meant black cod. Barbecued. The word barbecued doesn't seem appropriate to me in this connection. <laughs> Well, you know, black cod, it's the same fish that they use. Um, was it the famous Nobu dish, the miso cod? Oh. Uh, yeah. The same exact fish, except that the sable is cured and it's the, the other is cooked. Um, I think sable, actually, just going back, I love sable so much, but sable butter and bialy mm. or pletzel. We haven't mentioned bialy oh, or pletzel. Oh, I love a bialy. I think we need to just take a minute and appreciate it. Albert, you know what I never see anymore, but we grew up with and um, is, it's, it's a cousin of the Bialy, the onion board. Which you is know? a that's pretzel. It's a pretzel? I mean, a, it's a pretzel. Oh, okay. Right? Oh Isn't my God, we, I loved that. And they have sometimes sticks also, onion sticks. Right, right. And I exactly. like the flat like board mm -hmm. filled with onions. I, where can you get that these days? I haven't seen it in ages. I'm gonna ask a question. Okay. If there's anybody out there that remembers something called chicken carp. Melissa, you remember that? Chicken carp? Yeah. No, do chicken tell. Chicken carp preceded sable. Okay. Chicken carp was the poor man's sable until they discovered black cod. When I was a kid, Interesting. I, would, I would go to the appetizing store and get chicken carp. I'm sure somebody out there will remember it. Okay. Ed Blank wants to know, he's also asking about the differences between the different salmons, which I think we covered, but he's asking, do all these salmons use Atlantic salmon or can you make with Pacific? I, we see smoked Pacific salmon, don't we see that? Sure. Yeah, they use both, right? Sure. But it's important to note that Pacific smoked salmon is generally hot smoked. I see. Because that's in the Northwest, it, that's the tradition, is it's uh, a hot smoked salmon. So if you see Pacific smoked salmon, just make sure that it's cold smoked. Otherwise, you're going to get hot smoked, which is a whole other thing. And I don't like that on my bagel either. I love it in my salad, but not in my bagel. Can I just make some uh, mention a word, Len, that I have not mentioned yet either? Chubs. Is that a chubs. chicken? Is that, is that a chicken? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, a chub is a baby whitefish. It's just a baby whitefish. Okay. We used to get the chubs all the time too. We'd get the chub, we'd get oh, one yeah. chub. Oh, so good. They're very difficult to get now. We, had, we, had, we didn't have them at Zabar's for a couple of years because they were just destroyed by foreign bodies in the water. Oh. Very difficult to get, very difficult. Len, we have a comment from Judith Hallett uh, who says, she says it would be great if Zabar's could do a Yom Kippur Break the Fast cookbook in honor of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. So maybe if Saul and Carol are listening, they might want to pick up on that. 
But in honor of, of Ginsburg and her chef husband, Marty, who she had speak, spoke often of how he did all the cooking, right? And so Judith is asking whether either Marty or Ruth ever came into the store and or whether any of the other Supreme Court justices who are from New York ever came into the store that you remember. I have never met a Supreme Court justice. <laughs> okay. Um, Len, I, I'm, I was struck, I have been struck over the months reading your columns at your amazing memory um, for detail and storytelling skills. And, and you know, you have so many of these great tales of your interactions with customers. And then also more recently, you just wrote about your time as a soda jerk in three Bronx locations when you were in your teens. And this is, you know, not a little time ago. It's a while ago. So how do you manage at 90 to have such amazing recall for detail and stories? What is, what is that? I cannot answer that question. All I know is that certain things stay with me and certain things don't. I mean, I will never forget the first time I stuck my finger in a vat of melted milk chocolate. It was a time to remember. Uh, I, you know, you just remember thing, things that are really important to you, things that you love, somehow stay with you. That's about all I can say on that. Uh, I learned a lot of things when I was working as a soda jerk. That's where I learned how to roast cashew nuts, or rather deep fry cashew nuts. And I still do it to this day. At least once a week, I make deep fried cashew nuts. And I learned that when I was 13 years old. But I guess you learn by doing. And since I continue to do that, it stays with me. The um, thing you, that stay with me. I really want to know how you do those cashew nuts. Oh, okay. Easy, easy. I put maybe uh, two quarts of oil in my wok. And I take the cashew nuts. I separate the, the pieces from the whole ones. Because you always get pieces when you buy cashew nuts. And I put the fire on, I throw the cashew nuts in the oil, and I start to mix. You just have to keep those cashews moving. But there's a big trick to making the cashews proper. You cannot wait until they get to be the color that you want them to be. Because if you wait till they get to be the color you want them to be, and you take them out of the oil, they will get much, much darker. So you have to know at what point to take them out. And that's just by experience. I couldn't tell you when to take them out. It's my eye. My eye says, that's the right color. Take them out. I take them out and I pour them on my marble top table on top of uh, some newspaper or wax paper, salt them and eat them. Thank you. Uh, delicious, especially hot. It's a very good lesson about cooking and other things, right? You don't want to wait for them to be the color you want them to be. You have to take them out a little earlier. I feel like that applies to many things. Um, another couple of tachlis questions, and we'll try to just squeeze in a little bit more. How often do you sharpen your knives and do you do it yourself? I sharpen my knife myself. I have several different types of knife, knife sharpeners and I sharpen my knives as frequently as necessary. How do you know when it's necessary? When it's not sliding through whatever I'm cutting, it's necessary. It should be effortless slicing. Melissa, any last questions from you? Oh gosh, um, and by the way, I sharpen my knives myself too and you should do it all the time because if you do it all the time, they never get then you don't have to, it doesn't take much effort. You just- and All the time means like every time you take out a knife? No, um, uh, no, not that often, but like probably every couple of weeks, like every two weeks, like, but in and constant rotation. You just use the, the hand, the, the stick thing, or do you use an electric knife sharpener? That's honing. So you do that after you sharpen. The sharpening, I have a stone. Okay. I have a stone and you just kind of grind it. 
And what are your favorite brands of knives, both of you? Deborah Diggs wants to know. I don't think I have a favorite brand of knives. You got anything? Okay, you gotta just, it's again, you with whatever works for you, right? I have a lot of knives. <laughs> Did you bring your own knife? You used Zabar's knives at Zabar's, yeah? No, I use Zabar's knives, but I had my own set of knives that nobody else used but me, and I took care of those knives. Have you been back to Zabar's since uh, the pandemic at all? No, I have not. But I will one of these days go back. I, I'm looking forward to going back to work. You're going back to work, huh? When this is over? I'm looking forward to it. You miss it. I only want to go back if it's safe. And from what I've heard, there haven't been any incidents of people at Zabar's getting the virus lately. So I, I keep thinking about going back. I mean, I, I miss it. I really miss it. I'm sure the customers miss you as well. We are almost out of time. Um, Len, you told me earlier today that um, this run of your column um, over the last six months or so was not your first time writing for the forward. You had a front page article. Uh, what year was that again? 2014, you said? 2014, right. You, you want to show it to us and then maybe read some of your read from there? And that will be, we'll go out on that. There's Len. Too well. Oh yeah, okay, great. And I'm gonna let you have the last word reading this, but before you do, I just wanna thank again, Melissa Clark from NYT Cooking. You can follow her on Facebook and join the NYT Cooking Facebook group and watch for her book in November, Kid in the Kitchen. Um, thank again, uh, Lisa Lepson and her crew for this, putting together this amazing event. Thank you all for coming and please watch your email for all of the special things I have mentioned. Gemar uh, Chatima Tova, may you all be sealed well, have an easy fast, have a great break fast with some of the deliciousness that M Melissa and Len shared with us today. And I'm gonna let Len close us out with a little reading. Okay, I wrote this back in 2014, it's a little piece. Chaos surrounds me. The world is in turmoil. Palestinians and Israelis can't negotiate peace, though they have sought it for over a hundred years. Or have they? My friends inhabit the various stages of dying from Alzheimer's, from Parkinson's, dementia, cancer, COVID, and other forms of impending death. Between me and my salmon, there is peace. I gaze down on it, I slice it, and nothing else exists. Nothing but me and my salmon. Thank you, everybody. Good night.